see you, you develop and your play develop and uh, for so much deserved uh, uh, good work to flow through and uh, into and around you. It's, uh, it was a, a very impactful piece. There's a lot to work out in terms of uh, uh, representation and in terms of what a play can be or what a play is and in terms of what this play is. And I, I'd like to really uh, uh, make it as much of a group discussion as possible, but maybe to um, um, warm things up a bit, I have, I have a few uh, very basic questions for you, and uh, let's see what happens with that. And the first is just what, what are the, could you tell us sort of the natural history of this play? Where did it begin for you and how did it come into being? Um, I guess uh, the like the inauspicious <laughs> version is um, I I was I was researching a different play um, about an actor who is in a lot of Werner Herzog movies, um, and he is German, but like the son of a, a black American GI and a German woman, um, and he plays a, like a black American GI in all of these movies, and so I thought it would be an interesting topic for a play. I think it still might be. Um, I have not written it, but I, um, I was trying to work on it, and I just, I, I think that I, I just Googled black people Germany to get more information. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I think that, like, like, if not the first page of search, but, like, the, like, at the end of it was a genocide that I had never heard of, and had, and, and, um, had no, yeah, had never heard of at all, and so I became really fixated on that, and I happened to be, um, or I was living in Chicago with my now husband, um, and not uh, not not doing anything. So I went. I got to go to the University of Chicago Library a lot and did a bunch of research um, on the genocide. Um, but that doesn't actually totally say where this play came from. But I um, and then so I, I started doing research about probably like six years ago, and then actually um, started writing it um, at, as my thesis for you at Brown and started it um, in or. Started writing it over the summer, but then really started it um, during your um, class. So, yeah. Actually, didn't know that. No, I thought I it started in this in this class about photographic representation. Or something also, like that. that class. Yes. Just because I'm here, somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I, I started it a quick check of the guy that started pictures. Exactly. Here. That's a weird example. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, 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 good. So a long a long gestation process and and. Uh, a bit of a bit of serendipity, and it seems like this structurally the play that works way, the play works that way too. That you you enter one space and you you keep turning corners and finding darker and darker rooms inside this house. So the the play mirrors a kind of cognitive process, and maybe that's really the drama of the play is how we how we stumble upon and then stumble into genocide or these unspeakable conditions. Um, uh, this play, you, you told me earlier that the play had changed some, it, it felt different, it felt very different, not only because of your uh, wonderful cast, uh, it, it, you know, a superbly kinetic uh, and apt sense of direction, I think. Not only the production felt different, but the script also felt different, and I wonder if it actually was different and how it changed and why it changed. Yeah, it, it, it changed a lot. Um, because the, the, the first, the very first draft of it, um, was sort of like at the end of fall semester, and then we had workshop productions as part of our MFA program in the spring semester. Um, and the, that 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 draft was even more different. Where um, I think that it was, um, I'm just going to say bad things about it, and you don't have to agree. But I thought it was like really earnest, um, and it had shadow puppets. And it was like really different. And um, Are Ernest and Shadow Puppets like bad. <laughs> no, no, but it, it, was, it was just sort of like it was. It, it, um, um, the only text of that that survives are, are, are some like a lot of the or not all of them, but some of the letters were like that was like sort of the way that the whole play was. Mm -hmm. And um, and it just didn't feel actually like me writing it. And, um, and I think that part of that was because I was um, uh, not. I felt unable to to authentically talk to this thing that I was trying to talk to, and so I felt like I was like trying to sound great while talking about it, but then that what could be offensive or was offensive, I think, in a way. And so um, I sort of took a step back and started um, at Brown to introduce um, 
this idea of, of actors sort of failing to make the same play that I failed to make. And, um, and so that's, that was something that interested then. But, um, working on it in Chicago with the director, Eric Ting, um, I, I, I spent a lot more time defining these two worlds. And I think at, at Brown, it was sort of one continuous space and time. And then realizing that there was an opportunity to um, actually have a rehearsal in the play, um, and as a central idea of comparing, of, of, of trauma, and of reenacting trauma. And um, even if it's not um, finalized, it still is dramatic. Or even if it's not um, the biggest trauma that there's ever been, it's still dramatic. So um, that's, so the defining goes well to me. And it's something that's really different here than if it was before. Um, th th I, I have a final question, but sort of it, just an interim underlining here. I, I think some crucial words are uh, offense or fear of giving offense or wondering about what offends. Um, the idea of authenticity, it, it, it's so big in the play, so, so dramatically real. Um, trauma, what trauma is and how strange it is for, for a writer, for someone in an expressive profession to take on trauma, the paradox almost of that. And then lastly, I'm, I'm kind of curious about, you say two worlds, and I wonder maybe one thing we can talk about is what those two worlds are. But uh, the, the third question is, is uh, really just to give amplitude to the conversation, is what, what are you working on now? What's the, where do you go from here? Um, well, I'm, um, I'm working, uh, so I guess right now, uh, um, the, the, the next production that I'm working on is going to be in Providence at um, Trinity Rep. And it's going to be very different because it's a play about zombies. Um, so I think that it's like I need something that's like a little bit. Um, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be dark and twisted in, in some way, but um, it's a, a little bit lighter. Uh, strangely, yeah, the undead are lighter. Than um, uh, and then I'm, I'm also working on a play, sort of about photography, more directly. That um, I started at. Uh, there's a writer director lab at Soho Rep, and um, I, I started that play in that lab, and I'm still developing it. Well, it, I, maybe they're different in tone, but it, you, you've got representation again, and, and the persistent dead, in, in a way. The, some, zombies stick around. If zombies were only silly, the franchise would last as long as Chucky, you know, where, where it's, it's ridiculous and you can get away with ridiculous, or, or those, lep you know, the killer leprechaun movies. They, they last, you know, three or four iterations. But zombies are here to stay. And it, it, it's because there's something deep about zombies, even though they're a bit ridiculous. So I mean, you might be onto something there. Um, uh, let's uh, open it up to conversation. People have questions or comments. It, is Eric directing the Trinity Rep show? Oh, um, no. Um, uh, uh, the, the, this, uh, the artistic director of Trinity Rep is going to, his name is Kirk Columbus. He's going to direct it. Um, the letters you said did not mention black people at all. They have to be people. Is that true? Um, well, the letters uh, that are in the play are ones that I made up, and I, um, I, I, I have looked at some soldiers' letters, um, but I thought, uh, the, I thought that that was the dramaturgically the strongest choice, to have them not mention them at all. Um, it, it, just to pick up on a, an earlier kind of question I raised, in, re, in representing a, a disaster to which you don't have immediate access, you talk about making up the letters, what is authentic then? Or can you be authentic in representing it? Do you have, have you come to terms with that? Or do you have thoughts about that? I, I still haven't. I think, yeah. I mean, I think, because um, I, 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 I I know, I know that there isn't, I know that there isn't um, very much uh, uh, that I think like is denotatively authentic in the play. I think that there's things that are like connotatively authentic, and I don't even know what that <laughs> means. Um, but I, I think that um, I think that the that the that the authenticity in the letters is the absolute lack of thinking about telling the story from the experience of the people that are being colonized. And I think that that's like a really common um, common problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know about, 
I think that soldiers were probably authentically in love with their wives. Mm -hmm. I think um, that letters were actually written, mm -hmm. um, but the 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 form of them was more of a, of a of a vehicle for me to think about the humanity of the soldiers and think about their humanity in spite of doing something that completely negates the humanity of everyone around them. When the rehearsal was looking for a, a grandmother, someone who played a grandmother, there was a, first it was played by a black woman, then it was played, and that wasn't right, then uh, uh, an African American man, and that was to Tyler Perry. And, Finally, in the world of this play, the most authentic representative of the black grandmother was a, a white man. Is this along the same lines? Is it to underscore the fact that it's it's really about humanity rather than a, a scene? Yeah. And I think that he was able, or like in in the world of the play, he was both the most um, committed to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like that made it the best. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Good. I didn't finish my question. Oh, I beg your pardon. Um, I, I wanted to know what you were trying to achieve by writing this play. Um, I think that I, uh, I, um, I think that I like uh, in, earnestly or bear that was trying to shine light on a on a particularly brutal piece of history that I think not a lot of people know about. Um, but I also uh, was hoping to write a play about race that didn't make me want to die. Mm -hmm. Like I think that there are um, lots of plays about race where you are allowed to leave the theater and congratulate yourself for not being racist. And I think that that is pointless. So I um, wanted to create a play that hopefully uh, allow the men participating in it to have, to talk about it without falling into politically correct scripts. And also think about theater. That was, yeah, that's fair. There was something here, then there, and then we'll work around. Yeah. How much of the play came from working with actors and actual improvisation? Um, uh, very little of the text did, or like some of the text did, but um, the, the actors, I mean, the, most, the, the play was already completely written before the actors here were cast. Um, but the, the, the actors in, in this production um, worked both like as a, as a devising ensemble themselves and with the director to create all of the, uh, all of the presentation scenes or all of the scenes that are in the more theatrical lighting. So it was like, I, I didn't write that they should act like a cuckoo clock, and I didn't say that they should sing Beyonce and then Rihanna. But, um, <laughs> uh, but that, like, the, the text of, of those moments and like the, the openness for those moments to happen in the way that, this, that, that, these, that my collaborators here wanted to bring, wanted them to happen, was there. Would you script you even scripted in things like like and um? And oh yeah, 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 yeah. Which makes which they're amazing, and I still they're they're they missed they missed a few. All right. <laughs> Fifty cents a drop. <laughs> one, and then we'll go back. Uh, one of the fabulous uh, play. Thank you. And uh, I during the play, I don't know if this was planned by you or the director, or it just happens to be because of so rep the way they set it up. Uh, the audience reactions were part of the viewer's experience. And I actually kept seeing you and thinking, wow, she's really upset. Maybe it was all those missed ums and likes. You know? um, so how much of that did you anticipate that you wanted to involve the audience as performers in the play itself when you wrote it? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that came, I, I won't take credit for that. Really, like the that came out of conversations with the, the director Eric Ting. Um, when 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 the show was produced in Chicago, it was a, a very different space. It was like a traditional theater with like velvet red seats and like a proscenium. So like the the audience was the audience and the stage was the stage. And so, um, but during one of the talkbacks in that production, there was a there was an African American woman in her thirties, let's say, who talked about. A big part of her experience of watching the play was that she was sitting next to uh, 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 an older, older than her white couple, maybe in their 70s, 
and that she was very, she became very aware of them watching her during certain parts of the play, and she was also aware of herself watching them. And Eric was like, oh. <laughs> and, so, and so he thought that, because um, a lot of, I mean, this this space is an amazing space, and um, often, or in some productions here, there's like sort of risers that get that are normally against that wall, and you can have like that sort of audience stage experience. But then. Um, I don't know if people saw Uncle Vanya here, but like you sort of saw that it was. I can't believe it's the same space. Right? It, it's so weird. And, like, and I don't even know what the carpet did to the floors, <laughs> but uh, there was all of this beige carpet, and people were sort of seated on these like um, sort of like giant steps, and um, and like seeing the opportunity to have. I was I was really excited about um, having the opportunity to have no one, no one that far away from the action, and like being able to also actually have multiple conversations happening at once and having one side of the house hear one version of the conversation and another side of the house hear a different version. So um, that that was really exciting to me to have it be like environmental in that way. But the audience audience watching audience was very deliberate and um, very much due to Eric Ting's mad genius. <laughs> so not not only about the uh, the history, but how we approach the history or how we respond to the history. Did you have a? Yeah, um, I guess mine was more more a comment. Sure. I guess on just my experience of the play because um, uh, too uh, about sort of participating in theatre. I really felt like I wanted to say something <laughs> at many points and be part of the presentation. <laughs> Particularly when they walked out, it was just silent. I was like, okay, come on, can we all just like yeah. have a conversation? Yeah. That really, by the end of it, I was really in that place where I wanted to speak to everyone about what I was feeling. So that, I felt like that's like massive congratulations mm -hmm. on, on that front. And I just thought it was such bold, storytelling um, using history to show really where we are now in a way that we don't like to talk about it that way and I it was interesting that you said you know you, you don't want people sort of leaving feeling bad about being racist or, or where we are but it, to me it just felt like such a, a bold message that yeah we have sort of black people we have white people and there's this sort of still this big thing in between and you know but yet, I'm still feeling like, okay, but, there's, but now I can have this conversation. Um, and the most powerful thing to me was the line that the guy said, because I've been black all my life. That was, it just resonated with me so much. And um, yeah, I was, it was just very moving. And there's just so much going on in my head about it. So. I, there's no question there, but, it's, it's, but I, can I, I'm making an assumption, are you biracial mixed? Oh, it's, yeah, um, sort of, uh, com complicated, <laughs> no, 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 but the reason why I'm asking the question is because I felt that you dealt so well with sort of how both sides view it, and I wondered if you being possibly biracial <laughs> might have if, uh, sort of, what that play in you wanting to bring this play to, to, to play? I think, I think, I think for me, it's mo it, it, in some ways, it, it was, it's, it's more about, um, uh, my, my family is Jamaican. I was born here, but I'm a first generation American. And, um, there's, there's something about having a slight outside perspective. Um, and, uh, I mean, and not completely outside, but then also being both inside and outside at the same time. Um, and just sort of uh, only knowing America, like this, like I don't know, first generation American Jambalari, like I, I, what does it mean? Who am I? I'm not Jamaican, but I'm not American. Who am I? But, um, the, but there is something I think about um, only knowing American culture and also having some sense of how weird it is here, <laughs> um, uh, which I think is is part of uh, part of feeling empathy for two sides. Or like find, feeling empathy for like a false binary, or like something where you're like, oh, there's black and there's white, and like I feel like I can see, I can understand black, and I can understand white, but I don't understand either, and they don't, they're not like that. <laughs> <laughs>
that's <laughs> what, a, what a great place for a play to end up, that now we can begin the conversation. Maybe that's, the, that's a, a goal for so much of theater, that now we can begin the conversation. Yeah, so I second those, those things. And this issue of race versus racism, in a way, that you, I, I agree 100% that we'd much rather talk about sexism or racism or isms, which we can talk of as an ideology that we can take or leave. But, but race is something that we have to bring our own bodily experience to. It's much, it's much rarer to have a conversation about race. So to begin such an important conversation is, is fantastic. Um, other questions, comments? Uh, how about here? Yeah, and then we'll go back here. About, this is the third time I've seen it around <laughs> Chicago and now, and the, the setting with that audience. Uh, they were the actors, but the audience was not acting. And as I sat here watching it, the reactions were so genuine and very moving. And I had the feeling that at the end of the play, I could have had a very meaningful discussion with any one of them. And it, you know, it says something that so many people stuck, stuck around there. Right? Um, can, we, can we go back there and then I'll, I'll take these two? Here. I have to say that when the news came out, I thought I'm going to make a lot of enemies here, but I'm going to have to stand up and walk out or yeah. say something because this is not, I can't watch this. It's just too and I was also thinking about really early on when they were talking about who's playing who, I was like, who gets the right to tell whose stories? And do we co-opt other people's stories when we're telling them? And you also handled that really well because you showed, you didn't avoid the ugliness of it, you know, and yet everyone's stories were, were present, were there. So I want to thank you for that. So not merely telling the story, but confessing to the problem you're having telling the story it seems to be an important part of genocide witness it, I think. Um, you have a comment or a question? In the scene where um, he's first not allowed to go home, um, I mean, the first thing that came to my mind was um, Palestinians who can't go to their orange groves because they're not allowed. And then Iraq came into my mind. And by the end, it's right back to where we need it to be, which is a very upsetting moment. And I heard you say something about the letters. It was important to show the humanity of the soldiers. And I guess I was wondering why. <laughs> because I don't think that any of us in this room wouldn't do something similar if mm. put into that situation. I think that thinking that you're, that we're like, I, I strong, we're, yeah, I strongly believe that, um, that, that most people, when pushed, are capable of doing horrible things. And I think that really good people do horrible things all the time. Um, and so I think it's not as simple I think it's not as simple as as paintings one group as a as a villain, I think. Um, I don't I I wish it were that simple. But I just don't, I don't believe that it is. I mean feel a liberal theater artist where I feel like Everyone is capable of empathy, um, and everyone should try to empathize with everyone. Um, which is like, after I said that, it was gross. Um, but <laughs> the, but I, 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 do, I do think that it's it's easy to sit in judgment, and it's harder to look inside. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that everyone was culpable in creating that final moment, because it's I think even in, in terms of like bringing up the images in that final moment, that's something that I feel like everyone and everyone is implicated in that. About that implication, and, and to take it above the level of what you're calling the, the gross, I, I think I'm, I, I sense what you're getting at. There are at least three genocides that are referenced in the play. There's genocide against African Americans, genocide against the Herrero, and genocide against the Jews in, in, um, in Europe. Um, 
we have a habit of thinking of those as weird disasters, that these odd ir eruptions of irrational, unnatural violence. Wow, that's weird. And it keeps happening over and over again. It's not, an, it's not anomalous. So part of your, the culpability, or, as, as I understand the play, is that there's something consistent in human nature over time that is consistently vulnerable to a line of thinking that's actually been uninterrupted for hundreds of years. So genocide is not, is not anomalous, accidental, or purely emotional. It's, it's the regular exploitation of a weakness in human character by a deliberate and organized, sustained policy over time. Our cooperation in sustaining that ideology and um, our inability to uh, uh, embrace peace science, like a minister of peace, to exercise strengths that we need in our nature to resist that ideology. Those inabilities make us all culpable, and we all carry uh, genocidal capabilities in our social makeup and in our emotional makeup. Anyway, that's what I got. You had uh, I wondered um, your thoughts about why this Herrera genocide is unknown. I'm not sure. In, in other in other ways, I think um, I think its placement in history and, and 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 Germany's position in it makes it pale in comparison to the Holocaust. Um, I think that uh, because because it happened before World War One and because Germany perpetrated it, 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 it is in the shadow of the Holocaust in a lot of ways. And I think that um, generally, I people I think don't generally learn very much about African history in America. Um, people in, in, but then also people in Germany, some people don't know that it happened either. Um, because, and then I think it gets to like also like larger, um, larger things having to do with, I don't know, in, imbalances in, in the way that we Categorize knowledge, like why, like, like I, I think that yeah, like you take a German history class and then you take an African history class, even though that's clearly an imbalance. So I think we just learn less about that. Continent. No, because in your play you mentioned it as a rehearsal for the Holocaust. Yeah. So in view of that, and there's so much more about the Holocaust. So I would have thought that somebody would have pointed this out that the Germans have this history. The Jews weren't the first victims, but you know, there was genocide before that. And there have been people, there's a really great book um, by, um, and I always get his name wrong, so let me just name drop a name that I don't know. Um, but uh, that's by George Steinmetz, that's called The Devil's Handwriting, and it's about German colonialization in China, Africa, and also the Holocaust, sort of like, because Germany was involved in the Boxer Rebellion, Germany was involved in this genocide, and so there's, there's a clear line of of pedagogy, like those people taught those people who taught those people. There's, um, it's exactly as Eric's saying, it's not sort of like, woo, where did we figure out how to do this? It's sort of like we've been perfecting this over the course of, uh, I won't say what, like uh, over the course of decades, I'm not sure, over the course of centuries. So, um, I, uh, but it's not, I don't know, and also people, I don't know that um, if you're like, going on vacation, what you want to take with you is this book about genocide. I think that it's really hard to be in the mood to learn about something horrible. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's, it's not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not But sure. I mean, if we pretend to teach history, we should be teaching the truth. Well, we clearly, sh we clearly should. But I think you've also put your finger on a habit, a cognitive habit, that Africa is called the developing world. And I think there's some tacit assumption the genocide is appropriate to development. That in America, we had to develop the country. And it was too, it's really, really too bad about that genocide thing. But we had to do it to develop the country. Europe is still developing Africa. And a little bit of genocide is all right. It, this is, I think, a, an unsaid, but kind of bedrock assumption in world history right now. Oh, uh, one, two, go oh, down.
Um, yeah, actually I was thinking that um, one of the situations that the play made me think of is the situation in Zimbabwe where white landowners who have now, some of them, been in the country for, for generation after generation are now being violently forced off their land. And um, if you really want to, excuse my French, but just fuck with your mind reading about it, it makes you crazy because it's, it's an impossible, impossible situation. Um, and now I'm sitting here listening to you, Eric, and listening to you and thinking, is there such a thing as colonialization without genocide? Huh. Is there? I mean, is there? Can we think of one? Um, and there's something really actually, um, I found very, I, I, I really like about the play having the historical layers, that it layers, you know, our experience as Americans being colonizers, colonized, recolonizing others. Um, I love talking to my foreign black friends about Obama, who love to say, you know, they'll say he's not African American because he doesn't come from the slave lineage. Uh, I don't know any American who would say that. <laughs> it's really funny, but it's, it's always come from my foreign friends who say things like that. Um, and I, I, in fact, I'm going to stop talking right now because this is what I mean about like I love the the clusterfuck effect of your play. Um, and you know, if your goal was to set out leaving us not. I'm not racist, I can get a good night's sleep. You've really achieved your goal, and I congratulate you. It's not, it's not an easy goal. It's not an easy one. Thank you. So you point to a number of complexities. It's interesting that the play ends with a prolonged moment of silence. So the play isn't trying to unknot the knot. It's trying to get us to pay attention to the knot. So can I, can I say that there'll be two, two more, maybe? Because one, one more. One more? That's, can I say that? Good. Uh, how about you? Or someone who hasn't yeah, spoken before, Sarah? Did you want to ask and chances are we'll have kind of a soft exit so the conversation can continue. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jackie, for that. I wanted to ask, uh, I'm curious about the decision to foreground race in America and then also a historical moment that is so different, um, as opposed to talking about the history of slavery in America or if, I mean, I, I know the backstory you gave us was particular to Namibia and Nairobi, but I was struck by how, at the, through most of the play, Africa is kind of held as the unknown, and it stays that. And then at the end, in that final really intense scene, it seems like the resources people have to draw upon to tell the history of colonization are actually about slavery in America and about race in America. And that, it kind of leaves one still uncertain about this completely separate history lesson of German colonialism, which in fact isn't the history of race in America, but you're drawing a kind of a visceral connection to it through the, that final performance. I was, yeah, I was curious about what you could you make this a sentence about that long and repeat it louder? I'm sorry, but I just heard <laughs> Could you repeat the question that um, To, like, totally diminish the question and trying to repeat it briefly, I think that it was, like, sort of, like, uh, that... I feel like I just want to talk about it. Um, so that, uh, that, that um, asking about the decision to foreground race in America and have Africa remain sort of un, 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 not it, unexplored, undiscovered. <laughs> or just uh, the, the, the separateness the, of that yeah. history, German colonialism in a part of Africa, and then race in America. But I mean, those are just two distinct histories, and why you chose to bring them together through the question of race, uh, youth, contemporary culture. And, and I think it's because, um, because of the Americanness of the company and of myself, I think that, um, or actually, that's one reason. But like that, that um, I think that 
I think that the the, the actors and the characters in the play um, have the, uh, the best of intentions and are really interested in making theater that stri like that awakes other people or like I'm, I'm not saying, but like I feel like they. We're really, they're really sad about Rwanda in that situation. Oh, Zimbabwe, that's horrible. But like not really doing anything beyond like looking at Wikipedia about it and then like sort of not. And, and, and also like how complicated is it for, um, for like how, how much time would it take to, to, to feel ownership over this kind of material for these people? And like, I think that I struggled with it. And so I think that it's, I think that, 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 it's really hard to feel like an expert in something or to feel, um, or to become, to em embrace your own authenticity or your own authority on something. And so um, I think this is something that is, to me, in the inspiration of the play, um, is that there is something about America and, um, and this binary of racial dynamics that exists in America that's totally false, um, obviously, but that, that I think it's really hard for Americans to look at colonialism and not think about white versus black. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's really hard to see violence inflicted on a black body and not think about lynching in the South for Americans. And so um, it doesn't, in some ways, to me, um, it's like there, there are horrible pictures on the wall and I think um, some of them are pictures of Herrero being executed, and they look to me instantaneously like lynching photos. Like I can't not have that instantaneous brief switch in my brain. And, um, and I think that that is what the play is about, about how easy when something is, is not named, is not, is not discovered, it is to insert something else for it. How easy it is to sort of have a slippage between two things that are completely different if you don't care to define either of them. Or like talk about either of them. They don't really talk about race that much. They make jokes about it, but they don't actually talk about it in the play at all. So I think that's why. So going back to an early point in the conversation, we talked about these two worlds. And maybe something the play is saying is that it's not actually two worlds, it's sort of a Venn diagram that these, and a Venn diagram in motion, that these worlds are rotating around each other and influencing each other. So it's, it's going to remain, have to remain complicated. Um, for now, let's uh, 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 pause our conversation and change its form. We thank Jackie for her play, we thank Soho Rep for raising this difficult question.